Druids have been blessed in Baldur's Gate 3. After patch 5, an important bug was finally fixed. Tavern Brawler now applies to all wild shaping forms that attack with their bare fists or with attacks that can be considered unarmed. And that is great news, because Druids sworn to the moon draw on its mercurial nature to transform into massive creatures and primal elementals, of which many attack with their bare fists or unarmed. And these Druids following the circle of the moon are a true menace on the battlefield, shapeshifting into many of these different forms and animals to adapt to the situation. And that flexibility to become something so powerful for any scenario is truly terrifying. Especially now that Tavern Brawler has been fixed, finally. You will see why today. Abusing this build will result in a wanted death call for you. Wait, wanted death? That reminds me of that epic cyberpunk-esque hack and slash with the same name. Wanted death has a fun gun-fu combat system where you have to defeat hordes of enemies with both melee options like a katana or short-range pistols, but also long-range options like AMGs, assault rifles and even grenade launchers. All weapons have stylish finishers as well to play around with, and you ultimately want to defeat the many powerful bosses in the game to progress where each level has a unique boss. The game feels like a good throwback to iconic Xbox 360 and PS3 games and with a setting that reminds you of the 80 cyberpunk vision, culminating in a fresh experience where there is a fun mix of low-tech 90s retro and advanced technology. The combat also provides a challenge. You have to adapt to the situation or you will see that game over screen real fast. Despite the serious setting, however, the game is also very quirky and is ridden with jokes and easter eggs. And it has those nostalgic, addicting minigames as well for you when you want to take a break from all the fighting. And I have good news too because the first patch just rolled out for PC with many quality of life improvements and console players are getting the patch in a few weeks as well. So now is really the best time to play Wanted Dead as the game is currently 50% off on Steam until January 4th and the game is also available on the Epic Game Store and for console players on PS4, PS5, Xbox One and Xbox Series X and S. Use my link in the description to start the Cyberpunk Mayhem now and big thanks to Wanted Dead for sponsoring this video. Circle of the Moon routes are powerful tanky options to use as your frontliner. But they don't just tank, no. The idea is to go right into your enemy's faces, so close in their face that they become intimidated and scared, to the point that the battle is already lost at that point. Because your enemies will crap their pants. <laughs> And you know, nobody can physically fight when their pants are filled with excrement to the point that they become immobile. If you have always wanted to roleplay as a literal savage that doesn't belong anywhere in society and you just want to maul and shred everything to pieces to the point even your own party gets scared of you, you have come to the right video. What I'm really saying here is that these druids are so brutal that it's not just their tankiness that is great, it is also their crowd control like fearing enemies and their absolutely insane damage that comes in the form of at the very least 3 attacks per turn. Now for this build we're not going to just go pure moon druid. No, we're going to multi-class a bit. Mostly dipping after getting 10 levels of Circle of the Moon Druid for the simple reason that beyond 10 levels of Moon Druid, there is not much to gain anymore. Level 11 and 12 are quite lackluster. But everything before that is amazing. And at level 10 we have gotten everything we need from this epic class. So we're going to go 10 levels in Moon Druid, 1 level in Sorcerer and 1 level in Cleric. And this is my personal favorite distribution because it's simply just overpowered and a lot of fun to play. But more on all the details later as we progress in this video. Now before we get into the leveling, let's do a quick explainer to go over the basics on how wild shaping works in Baldur's Gate 3. Basically, as a druid, you get an ability called Wild Shape. Selecting this ability, you get a vast majority of options to transform into, and you unlock more and more of these forms as you level. And many of these different powerful creatures and elementals have their own perks and benefits that will become clear to you in this video. What is nice is that Wild Shaping comes as a bonus action, so you can Wild Shape and in the same turn still maul your enemies completely. It is a great combo. However, it is important to know that when in your wild shape you get completely new stats for things like your strength and dexterity as well as your armored class. So you basically become a completely new character altogether and as you see these animals are all naked. So your gear doesn't morph with the beast that you transform into, meaning gear doesn't do anything for you when you are in your shapeshifted form. 
This in turn then means that Gear isn't as important for a wild shaping brawler frontliner druid compared to many other classes, as you definitely want to wild shape as much as possible. Making this build a really altruistic and amazing choice for any party composition as a frontliner in this case, because there's one member less you have to worry about for contesting certain key gear pieces. Now that doesn't mean that gear is completely useless on a druid, because there's definitely useful gear for when say, for example, you lose your wild shaping form somehow, that I will get into later on in this video. And finally, the build today is really powerful and works on any difficulty mode, including solo tactician and the new honor mode. Speaking of honor mode, reason why this build is now even better is because builds that have the ability to stay alive for a really long time have increasingly become more wanted thanks to honor mode, and moon druids do that. You can basically see them as a tank with multiple HP pools, because you get multiple wild shapes per short rest, and when you die in your wild shape form, you still go back to your original humanoid form, which also will have at least 100 HP easily with today's setup. And considering these wild shapes on themselves can already go higher than 100 HP as well, that can mean like hundreds and hundreds of HP for a combat encounter through your frontliner, your druid, making them an insanely good life insurance and a great anti-party wipe party member that can tank, CC and destroy. Now that you know what you can expect, let's get started with leveling. And we're starting out with picking our Druid, obviously. And you get to pick a few cantrips right away, and I would highly suggest picking Shilly Lag for the early levels, because your resources are still very limited at this point. And this cantrip enhances your staff or club that you will start out with, or can find really quickly, resulting into you simply doing more damage. For your other cantrip, I would suggest to take guidance for having an easier time in succeeding ability checks, which in turn can help you out with advancing positively in many scenarios. Ability-wise, we go with 16 Wisdom as it scales through spellcasting and is one of the few abilities that actually transcends into your wild shape form and thus is the most important ability for us. We also get 16 Dexterity for the initiative, so our turn starts earlier and in turn resulting into us having a bigger influence on dictating the curse of the battle and Dexterity provides us extra armor class as well in humanoid form, which is very nice. And 15 Constitution for the HP and the saving throw bonus for maintaining concentration spells and we will get this to 16 really quickly via a feat that it will go over in a second. Now for your race, I would say that Wood Elf or Wood Half Elf are great options here thanks to the extra movement that you get with them, as well as their sustain related perks like Fey Ancestry, which helps out against Charmed and Sleep status effects from the enemy. Duigar is also very good thanks to Duigar Resilience and Superior Dark Vision. However, the main selling point of the Duigar is definitely Enlarge, which you get at level 3, and this one does in fact work in your wild shape forms. Yes, making it one of the few race bonuses that actually works in your wild shaped form, so that is a great bonus to get through this race. I would say those three options get my preference, but in the bigger scope of things, your race choice doesn't really matter that much, so by all means pick whatever you want. And Helsen, by the way, your potential Druid companion, is actually also a really good Druid pick for if you don't want your face to be the Druid, but rather a party member of yours. Because Helsen is in fact a Wood Elf as well, and he gets some exclusive abilities like the Cave Bear while shape form that can be potentially interesting. This wild shape is basically a more aggressive alternative version of the bear wild shape that will go into in a second because the cave bear has a multi-attack for an action that deals great damage for sure. So that may be a good alternative choice for you. Background you can do anything you want really. Something that scales with dexterity or wisdom is probably going to be your best bet. What do you like to roleplay as? Now at level 2 you get to prepare 5 spells and I would suggest to prepare the following spells as early as possible. First of all, fairy fire. No questions asked. This thing is absolutely amazing for those first levels. Why you ask? Because it grants advantage not just to you, but your entire party, to whatever you cast it on. So that can be easily a bunch of enemies because the radius is actually quite big as well. And you getting advantage for everyone in your party means everyone has a much higher chance to hit your targets. And in those early levels, we all know everyone is still more likely to miss their targets due to just being relatively weak to the point that we want to rage quit sometimes. So that is a very welcome bonus that we get with Fairy Fire. 
Your second spell will be Thunder Wave, and it's a great option here to grab. It is the best damaging spell you can get as a level 1 druid in my opinion, because it has AoE damage and the ability to just insta-kill enemies by shoving them into chasms, which is great, obviously. For your third spell, make sure to grab Long Strider. The faster you get this, the better. Extra movement is an absolute blessing in this game. It just gives you so many more options in combat, both offensively as well as defensively, and it's a ritual spell, so it doesn't consume a spell slot, and later on you can upgrade as well to make sure your entire party gets it awesome spell fourth is going to be healing word having heals on a bonus action that you can cast from a distance is great you can also use it to bring down party members back into combat which makes it a very good spell speak with animals is going to be my fifth recommendation this is one of the best non-combat spells in the game it provides you the ability to speak with animals and that leads to a bunch of extra dialogue but also content with special quest rewards related to these animals. Really good option. At level 2 you also get to choose your circle, and here we're going to go with the ultimate wild shaping circle, like I already hinted at, the circle of the moon. Circle of the moon basically gives you exclusive wild shapes that are really powerful, and just gives you a bunch of extra good things that help out with your wild shapes. You also unlock a bunch of wild shapes right off the bat, which is actually great, because you get to level 2 very quickly in this game, and thus you don't have to wait too long to actually start having fun with this class, unlike some other classes. And as a moon root, you also get the bear summon as a super exclusive, which is going to be your defensive, really tanky option that I'm also going to start off with covering. The bear is a good tanky option early on, as it gets a whopping 30 HP, which at level 2 is quite nice to say the least. But what makes the bear especially a good defensive option is that it can goad enemies with goading roar into attacking your bear form instead of your much squishier allies at this point in time. Or any point in time really, because the bear keeps getting more and more tanky with every two levels. And then the bear also deals quite nice damage with just dishing out damage with its claws. It's a monster, really. While the bear is a great defensive option, I would say for an offensive option, however, you want to go with the wolf. The wolf is also unlocked at level 2. And the wolf can dish out some very incredible damage early on due to it having exposing bite. Exposing Bite is your best friend. Now with Exposing Bite, not only do you deal damage with it, it will also guarantee your next attack to be a critical hit. And as you may or may not know, critical hits in this game do a ton of damage. In addition to its offensive capabilities, the Wolf can also provide you very useful utility with Inciting Hall, for example, giving the entire party additional movement, and it also has pack tactics, giving your allies advantage on certain targets. All across the board, the Wolf provides to be an excellent offensive option with utility. At level 2, however, you also get the opportunity to wild shape into a badger. Does anyone here have sunglasses for our badger? Because a badger can be a really amazing option for the more stylistic and strategic plays, due to the fact that it has an ingrate misty staff that can CC enemies that you can use on a turn to turn basis. Yes, that sounds as amazing as it is, really. Because you can maneuver through the entire battlefield every turn, and then the burrow of a badger can actually also cause enemies to be prone, which in turn is an amazing status effect, especially this early on, as being prone means everyone at the the target will do so with advantage and the target that is laying on the ground can naturally not use actions, cannot move and has disadvantage on various saving throws. So all in all, just a really good thing to inflict on your enemies and the badger can do so every single turn while also having insane mobility. The badger also has the ability to push enemies away, which can be highly advantageous considering the druid will, as we level, pick up a bunch of area-based impairing effects that you do not want to be a part of and the badger can, yes, push enemies inside those areas. So it is a really good option that also actually synergizes with the rest of the kit. The cat, on the other hand, is probably the only one that I would say is not as good as the others, mostly because its use case is more non-combat oriented to crawl through tight spaces, and you can however meow with the cat to gather enemies to set up for an attack though, but that's also where the usefulness of the cat ends in combat. They're cute though. Then the final shape that you get at level 2 is absolutely broken beyond repair, just like in real life by the way, because this one causes many traumas, the spider. Now, I'm not joking because the spider is insanely good for those early levels, due to the fact that you get the ability to use web. Web covers quite a big surface that can make anything inside it and webbed. And webbed meaning they cannot move and you have advantage against them. Now, web in its spell form is a concentration spell, but the web ability that comes with the spider isn't. Yes, so you can spam those webs as the spider and completely 
dominate the battlefield, potentially AoE and webbing all of your enemies every single turn, giving your moon root an insane power spike if you go for that strategy. Amazing CC and the ability for your entire team to hit with more accuracy, yes please, but that isn't even where it ends because the web is a bonus action, so you can combine it with your regular attacks. And the spider is also ferocious as it can bite your enemies for high damage, but then also poison them simultaneously making life much harder for your enemies. So all in all, the spider is just busted and honestly, four out of five shapes that you get at level two are really good. So use them appropriately depending on the context of your combat scenario. Basically a quick summary, spider if you want to go the easy right and completely dominate, bear if you need the defensive, tanky option, wolf if you're feeling offensive and want additional utility, and badger if you really want to strategically dominate your enemies through your positioning. At level 2 you also get Lunar Mant and I'm honestly not really a fan of this ability. You can sacrifice a spell slot to heal yourself with it and the higher you go the more you will heal yourself with it. But the conversions are quite bad if I may say so, so I tend to skip it. You could however use it if you really have no other uses for your spell slots and you're feeling desperate and need to heal, but otherwise I would steer away from it. Level 3 you get level 2 spell slots and you get the opportunity to use something absolutely amazing. Flaming Sphere. Now you might have heard me praise this spell in previous videos, but this thing is actually amazing and before we get into why Flaming Sphere is so good, I want to just quickly elaborate on my reasoning for the spells that we will take for our Moon Root with some dips to really optimize our spell selection and get the most out of a Moon Root. We're going to essentially focus on three different types of spells as we progress and those spells complement your wild shapes the best in my opinion. Now you can't cast spells from your humanoid form while you are in a wild shape form obviously so you want to use stuff that you can use in parallel to your wild shapes or stuff that you can cast while out of wild shape that will still in some way support you and your team while you are in wild shape and the first type of spells that can facilitate that are going to be summons like flaming sphere because you can use them in addition to your wild shapes and they provide you extra power on the battlefield the second type of spells are going to be terrain altering concentration spells that will make life harder for your enemies through cc debuffing or damage while we're wild shaping and because these are concentration spells they will maintain in your wild shaping forms till you're hit out of it so a great thing to pair while wild shaping i have to say that a druid is the king of zoning and area control so these spells are really powerful when used well and the final type of spells are going to be supportive spells that you can either preemptively cast and will last till your next long rest such as long strider or spells that you can use if things go south like healing and curing. Now that you know what we're aiming for, let's talk about Flaming Sphere for a second, the spell we picked up at level 3. Flaming Sphere is a massive ball of fire that you can cast and due to its sheer size it's hard to avoid for your enemies, so they tend to attack it more often than not, especially when you put it on choke points, making it a great pair with you as a wolf or a spider because the Flaming Sphere distracts and tanks but also can deal some amazing damage on its own by the way and meanwhile you can do your wild shaping duties for even more damage. This is obviously a really good combo and Flaming Sphere can also interact with flammable objects by the way so you can strategically blow things up for more damage and all in all just get an insane amount of power through this spell hence why we take it at level 3 and as early as possible. Level 4 is another really good level for us as we get our first feet but we also get more shapes. We're going to start off with the cantrips however and I would suggest to take Thorn Whip here. For a cantrip this thing has actually quite some use because you can use it to attack enemies from a distance first of all but also pull things towards you so you can use it strategically in different ways such as pulling enemies into holes or pulling the enemy away from your allies. For new wild shapes we then also get decent options. It's not the main selling point however of this level but we get the dire raven which is actually quite a squishy shape but it can in fact blind your enemies so for caster type of enemies it can be actually tremendously useful as you may or may not know blindness limits the range in which the blinded entity can attack and it gives them disadvantage while giving you advantage overall a really good cc the other new wild shape is the deep rati and this one actually has a really fun ability you can charge with it into your enemies for good damage and it's yet another source of applying the very powerful Powerful prone on your enemies so it's an aoe damage potentially prone inducing ability do i need to say more than that really and then its core ability deals nice damage as well and it's great for breaking through those annoying doors and walls another nice shape to use and while the shapes are nice and all the real winners here that you get is first of all our seventh spell spike growth spike growth is absolutely amazing you cast it and it controls a big portion of the area 
However, what is especially so deadly and good about spike growth is that every single time an enemy moves on it or through it, it takes damage. And that damage can, cumulatively speaking, become absolutely insane versus a bunch of different types of enemies in the game. Sometimes it can just win you the fight all by its own. Especially around these lower levels because it is a level 2 spell, remember? And what is also good is that every single instance of damage triggers a check. So enemies with concentration spells on can easily lose their concentration just by trying to move around on these spikes. And oh, Spike Road also halves movement of your enemies, so it's safe to say that this thing is pure torture. You being able to use it while also being wild shaped is another huge bonus, obviously. This spell pairs exceptionally well with the Badger since you can burrow beneath it to end up at an enemy target to prone it into just obliterating them straight up. Or you can also mix it with the just unlocked Raven since the Raven can in fact fly over these spikes to move around. So move around, blind enemies, attack them while they are simultaneously being eaten up alive by the spike road. Yes, that combo is delicious. So that is an absolutely amazing spell for a druid. Get it, you do not want to miss out on it. And then what is also so good at level 4 is that we get our feet, which is like we started the video off with, absolutely no questions asked, going to be Tavern a Brawler. Give Constitution here the plus 1 bonus to get it to 16, hence why I started with 15 to get the opportunity to make it even here, and now we have more HP and a better time maintaining concentration spells as well. And Tavern Brawler works on all of our wild shapes that attack unarmed, and it modifies the strength modifier of these wild shapes, giving us flexibility in our humanoid form by just completely dumping strength because it's only relevant for when you're wild shaping. Tavern Brawler gives you an amazing increase in damage, but you also get such an insane accuracy with it that results into you essentially always hitting your enemies with your wild shapes and never missing from this point onwards. Absolutely amazing. Especially when you consider what we get at level 5, Wild Strike. Yes, moving forward we can attack twice instead of just once in our animal forms. Really good and even better with the Just Gotham Tavern Brawler. For spells, we get another absolute banger here and our first level 3 spell, Plant Growth. Now, Plant Growth completely decimates the enemy's movement. Just look at this clip, it's it's just hilarious. <laughs> and the best thing is, you can spam these Plant Growths and stack them even because they are not a concentration spell and each one lasts like 10 turns, making it an absolute huge pick here as we can use them in conjunction with our wild shapes. But it gets better because at level 6, we get an absolute nuclear level up. Two words, the Owl Bear. The Owlbear is such a devastating form for you, it is game over going forward here for any enemy you will ever face. First of all, it has an ability called Crushing Flight that gives you huge movement on the field and whatever you land on, well let's say it ain't got a lot of time left on this plane of existence and it might also get the great prone status effect at the same time. And since this ability, Crushing Flight, is a bonus action, you can accordingly just maul them completely and destroy them afterwards using your regular attacks which consume your action and now you get two of them and later on, spoiler red, you get 3 attacks at level 10, making the Owlbear even better. You definitely want to utilize this combo as much as possible, especially because nobody is withholding you from using it literally every single turn. But that is not even everything you get with the Owlbear. You also get an AoE attack known as Rupture, but even better is Enrage, which is also technically an AoE ability that fares everything around you potentially, but also increases your strength with 2. So all round really good abilities and just a monstrous form. Level 6 is a big one for your playthrough and is yet another huge power spike. If you thought that was all, no, you also get the Panther, which unlocks stealth play for you. So you now have pretty much come to a point where you can do everything really with your wild shapes and really go for different scenarios in combat, because with stealth you can set up for a nice surprise attack for instance to cause all your enemies to skip a turn, but it will also deal extra damage when you get out of invisibility. And the Panther also has that ingrained prone through pounds, which is a leap attack and it rewards you for attacking prone targets because it will in fact deal extra damage against everything that is laying on the ground with its juggler strike nuclear ability. All round panther is a really good shape as well and with both of your new forms unlocked, well let's say you're eating really good onwards after this level. You also get primal strike by the way at level 6 which is great for overcoming resistances from certain enemies and we get another option to get at level 6 for our spells and here we're going to go with sleet storm absolutely another amazing area control type of ability sleet storm is the answer to casters with concentration spells it just says no to them 
you're not going to concentrate. Really good counter to those casters, and it also makes the entire area icy. So another source of inducing prone, and yeah, that can synergize with a lot of things, let's say. Level 7 is another huge one, because we unlock one of the best root abilities in the game. Conjure Woodland Being. This thing is the definition of overpowered. Why you ask? Well, this is a summon, and this summon can summon a summon on its own. So basically it's summonception, and the respective summon that comes out of this summon can summon as well. Huh? Oh, okay, not, let's not get ahead of ourselves, but it can apply CC of its own through its entangle abilities and also just tank and attack normally. So it's essentially just another sort of damage and another HP sponge and more CC. But the woodland being, so the main summon, has something very interesting on its hot bar. Do you see it? Yes, spike growth. Everything I just said about that absolutely overpowered ability, well, our summon can now cast this amazing ability on its own. So we can concentrate on something else like Flaming Sphere or Sleet Storm while our summon takes the Spike Growth Duty. Beautiful. But it gets even better because the summon has an ability called Nature's Step and it applies to the entire party. It makes us immune to difficult terrain and that is obviously a huge effect to have because from this point onwards we don't get affected by the movement impairing effects of our own area controlling abilities like plant growth or spike growth while enemies at the same time will still have their lives completely ruined by those ability giving us full domination on the battlefield make sure however the woodland being is summoned as much as possible in your playthrough to have that effect as active as much as possible because for a level 4 summon it does truly fascinating things oh and it also packs a punch so all around the board absolute s plus tier pickup right here Level 8, we get our second feat, and we get the Sabertooth right here, guys, and you know what that means. Let's first talk about the Sabertooth, because this thing is a menace. It's a bit of a mixture of a panther, a all bear, and the normal bear. There's a few reasons for why I say that, but from a damage perspective, it can lower our enemy's armor class through its shred armor, which is nice, and shred armor also deals damage. But it also has the same juggler strike as the panther, however the main selling point for running the saber suit is going to be its animalistic vitality passive. It's 2d8 automatic healing every single round of combat, so it has great offensive capabilities, but also great sustain and thus defense, making it a really good form as well. And it can just straight up heal all the way to full HP when cumulatively it just keeps healing every single turn. So another good shape to transform into for sure. We also get another feat to pick up at level 8 which is huge. Alert is a good option for more initiative since the faster we have our turn the faster we can start manipulating the battlefield as well as make our presence known. However we will get a bunch of extra initiative through gear and we already have 16 dexterity so it is not as important in my opinion. Warcaster is also great due to the fact that we have a bunch of concentration spells in our kit in humanoid form but what takes the cake here in my opinion is the resilient feat as it transcends into your wild shaping form. So yes you will in fact benefit from the plus ones you get from these both strength and dexterity are my favorite here strength synergizes with our tavern brawler in wild shaped form but the winner here is going to be resilient dexterity few reasons our strength modified through tavern brawler and the implications of that is already absolutely overpowered we don't need another plus one in strength dexterity however is going to benefit our initiative and ac in wild shaped form which is great. And as you see in the table on bg3.wiki, there are quite some important wild shapes that will benefit from that plus one to dexterity because they get even dexterity level. So I do like to go with resilient dexterity here, but that's not even all because as you may or may not know, resilient dexterity gives proficiency in dexterity saving throws and those are very important for a frontliner. Think about things like negating CC related abilities bestowed upon you by the enemies to not lose your concentration spells, but also negating damage or powerful spells cast against you. They are tied to very useful mechanics that with this proficiency you will have a better time resisting. So all in all what I'm saying is resilient dexterity is a great option here. For your spell I'm going to recommend Conjure Minor Elemental. Now for your level 4 spell slot I highly do suggest you to prioritize the woodland being since it's just much better but the minor elementals are quite nice as well. However we will unlock something even better in a second but keep in mind you can in fact stack all your summons that you see here which can mean a lot of extra power on the battlefield. Speaking of set better spell that we unlock look at that we're level 9 
Conjure Elemental is what I was talking about. You can swap the Minor Elemental out right away for it if you want, because it's just a better spell in all shapes and forms. However, it does consume a level 5 slot at the very minimum instead of a level 4 spell slot, but I would say you want to upcast Conjure Elemental and more on that in a second when we get to level 10. You can now also swap out Conjure Minor Elemental for something more powerful like Insect Plague, which is another area controlling spell that can do bits for sure and stacks with other spells like Spike Growth and such. You could also just put in Great Restoration here, another level 5 spell for if things go south, you know, it will provide you a way to cure allies, but outside of that, level 9 is mostly just new spells. Level 10, however, is a big one, a really big one. Because we get another cantrip. Nah, I'm just joking. But Produce Flame is probably best here. Reason why level 10 is so good is because, well, many reasons actually. Let's start off with saying we get another attack every single turn through Improved Wild Strike. Our wild shapes can now attack three times a turn. That is amazing and really good and I like it. You also get a new spell here. Mass Cure Wounds is probably a good option for if things go south. But you also unlock the Dilophosaurus. Say that 10 times in a row and see what remains of you. This one is absolutely amazing. It has a ranged nuclear missile built in basically. If you want to snipe things from across the battlefield, Corrosive Spit is your friend. But it also can pounce enemies and bite them, dealing not just piercing damage but also acid damage. Yes, we now have a source of acid damage in our team, making it complete with the Myrmidons that I will talk about in a second. What makes the Dilophosaurus amazing, however, in particular, is that it can melt armor class away due to Corrosive Spit. So those enemies with a lot of AC use Corrosive Spit and you can remove up to 5 whopping AC from them with this ability, making life a lot easier for you and your entire party. Really good at trivializing certain tanky and annoying bosses with very high AC. Aside from the Dilophosaurus, you also unlock the Myrmidons, which is exclusive Moonroot territory, and these are absolutely great things. It's one of the main benefits of going Moonroot. Now, I didn't talk about Conjure Elemental, the spell we took at level 9 yet, but that's because you want to upcast Conjure Elemental when you get your level 6 spell slot. And that way, not only will you be able to wild shape into a Myrmidon, you will also summon a Myrmidon like yourself in addition. Yes, Shadow Clone Jutsu time. Double the trouble. There are now two of you and that's why Conjure Elemental is so good as a spell choice as well. Now the Myrmidons come in four flavors and all of them are great really. They all have something unique and good going for them. And I'm going to start out with the Earth one because it's the only one that attacks unarmed and thus benefits from Tavern Brawler, making it exceptionally good. I would say to the point that many nightmares are made of these Earth Myrmidons. The Earth Myrmidon not only has over 100 HP, it attacks with such power that nothing ever has a chance against it. It can wipe out entire parties all by itself and also has various abilities related to the Earth that can benefit from it. Things like AoE damage and abilities to knock surrounding enemies prone. But the greatest feat here is obviously those Tavern Brawler enhanced 3 attacks per turn on a shape that already starts off with a whopping 18 strength. Use the Earth Myrmidon for when you just want to feel like an open hand Tavern Brawler Monk Rogue build and we all know what that build entails. The Fire Myrmidon is really good as well because not only has it 3 attacks, it has a built-in haste functionality. So in honor mode that is another attack and in regular mode that is 3 more attacks, huge extra power and its attacks are both single target but this one also has the capability to do a nice little AoE cone type of fire wave which does pack a punch for sure. It also has built in hellish rebuck and can send your targets ablaze so applying the burning status effect essentially which will deal damage to your targets every single turn. Very good. The water Myrmidon is really good as well because it has this AoE type of attack called explosive icicle that you can launch from a distance and it's three different hits with a single cast so that is amazing power obviously. Just look at the village, trivializes some encounters completely. The Water Myrmidon also has powerful single target attacks that can chill its targets called Hemal Strikes. And on top of all of that, it also has a heal ingrained in its kit. And it's an AoE heal, so do I need to say more? The Water Myrmidon is also just fantastic. Finally, we have the Ur Myrmidon for your lighting damage. And this one has a good ability to control the field essentially, but also has Electrified Flail, which is a single target hard hitting lightning attack that can in fact stun your enemies. So another great contender for your shapes to wild shape into. These elementals cover you for 4 different types of damage essentially. And if you want to make use of the enemy's weaknesses, then it's accordingly a wise choice to use the appropriate Myrmidon. If your enemy is weak against gold, use the water Myrmidon. If your enemy is weak against fire, the fire Myrmidon is your friend and so on. 
But ultimately, these Myrmidons in themselves are a big reason to go Moon Druid because they add incredible additional power to your wild shape roster, both in terms of new types of elemental damage to use strategically, but also just with their kits being insanely strong. Now that we're done with leveling our Moon Druid, and as you just saw from everything I just said, the build has incredible variety. It has so much things going for it, and also keep in mind that every spell we chose is prepared, so that means that all the spells that we didn't choose are still a possibility to use at any time making this class another benefit you can just prepare whatever you want to use at any time as a druid so you can also check out the ones we didn't pick but i do think the selection i made here in this video is easily the best one as you level we pretty much got a new amazing spell at every level shout out to wall of fire however we didn't mention it yet but this is a very powerful spell as well that you can definitely use here and there to cut off choke points and accordingly enemies will jump to their death if you play it well freedom of movement is also a good alternative shout for if you can't always rely on your conjure rootland being for that immunity to difficult terrain so after getting 10 levels in moon druid it is time to multi-class like i also stated at the start of the video reason being is because we don't really need a third feat with tavern brawler being so good and we've already unlocked all wild shapes and all goodies at level 10 anyway so it is a perfect time to start multi-classing. First tip we're going to get is going to be a Draconic Sorcerer. Now I would strongly suggest to respect at level 11 and go level 1 Sorcerer into 10 levels of Moon Druid and pick everything exactly as we just did in this video. Again, yes, it's worth the effort because starting out with Sorcerer at this point in time grants us that constitution saving proficiency of the Sorcerer class and at level 11 that translates to a whopping plus 4 bonus to the rolls of our die giving us a nice boost for maintaining our concentration spells. And we do have a a bunch of concentration spells in this build as you may or may not have noticed so that bonus is really welcome while this proficiency is nice to have i would say that you don't want to initially start with the sorcerer because that would mean we would delay so many good things like great shapes at level 2 tavern brawler at level 4 extra attack at level 5 owl bear at level 6 bunch of great shapes and a third attack at level 10 and so forth the level 1 delay for all those things stacks and just makes you miss out on a lot of power at certain phases in the game so the respect is really good here and i would definitely recommend it however if you don't like respect then it's not that much of a problem the constitution saving throw proficiency is just one slice of the pie of goodness that we get with dipping into sorcerer because draconic sorcerer also gives us draconic resilience which is a nice bonus to our ac for unarmored wild shapes that have lower than 13 armor class and as you know all our shapes are in fact unarmored and there are a few wild shapes that have less than 13 ac as you can see in the table so they will benefit from draconic resilience which is really nice and the only draconic color that will actually synergize with our build and that is simultaneously very powerful for a moon druid is going to be the white one because it gives us armor of agatis armor of agatis doesn't just work in your normal form no it actually stays with you in your wild shape making this an absolute amazing a multi-class dip for this build and idea behind it so you'll have armor of agatis active while you're in wild shape form and that is obviously huge because this is extra hp and it has that retaliatory factor of dishing cold damage back every time something hits you and if you upcast it to say level 5 and i would recommend to do so because you can cast armor of agatis preemptively and it can last till your next long rest you can deal 25 damage back to back to whatever hits you at any time you can literally now just kill off enemies while it's their turn in your wild shape form which is another very welcome power increase to our build just make sure to upkeep armor of agatis as much as possible as a sorcerer you also get to choose a few spells and cantrips and i would highly suggest to go for sustain and utility here as pure damage spells scale through the sorcerer's main ability which is charisma and we are a wisdom based spellcaster so that is a mismatch Good options for cantrips will be the Ray of Frost for that movement reduction from a distance, Shocking Grasp for that reaction denial, and both of those cantrips have that synergy with Wetness to get their damage doubled, which is a nice bonus. Blade Ward for reduced damage, Minor Illusion for group gather potential setups for AoE nukes, Spells we go Magic Missiles for guaranteed damage from a distance when we need to, and something like False Life or Shield for extra sustain. Now for your final dip, I would highly suggest to get a level in War Domain Cleric. Few reasons why, first of all, War Domain Cleric gives us weapon proficiency which is nice for our water fire and air myrmidons that we just unlocked because they are the ones that use a weapon that requires proficiency for optimal results with the war domain cleric dip we will be able to use these myrmidons with the most optimal results and they now can compete with our earth myrmidon form that in fact benefits from our tavern brawler just like every single other animal that we can morph into and another main selling point for
for the war domain cleric dip are the war priest charges which gives us extra attacks on our bonus action and that aspect really does synergize with our improved wild strike which already provides us three attacks with our main action and now with these war priest charges we can also attack up to three times extra every long rest with our bonus actions for up to four attacks in a single turn absolutely amazing you then also get some extra useful spells as a cleric you get shield of fate for extra sustain and divine favor if you need some extra damage as a gift for going war domain cantrips go resistance thaumaturgy and light for some nice extra utility that we don't have yet and you also get potentially some very useful cleric spells to prepare and that's great because clerics just like groots have their spell casting driven by their wisdom so there's a great synergy to be found there I would get Guiding Bolt for the ranged attack that can apply advantage on our targets, Command for the various amazing CC options, Sanctuary for if you need to be immortal for some turns and want to have a big safety net included in your kit, really good on honor mode but any mode really and Bless for the extra accuracy on our attacks and saving throw bonuses for our entire team. As you see the Cleric provides some really good level 1 spells that also synergize with our build and Dipping Cleric is really just another win-win situation. And with that my friends we have now completed the leveling progress in its totality. It took some time but we have done it and as you probably have seen from everything we have gotten this build is incredibly versatile with our 10 moon root and two dips one white dragon sorcerer one war domain cleric multi-class distribution we have completely optimized the idea for this build and we have gotten as many synergies as possible for our wild shapes which is the most important aspect of this build now like i said your armor and gear doesn't transfer over to your wild shaping forms however that doesn't mean that gear is completely useless gear can in fact be really useful and you want to basically gear yourself with three main notions in mind one, use the few gear pieces in the game that actually do transfer over to your wild shaping form. And yes, there are in fact some pieces specifically catered to us wild shapers. Notion 2, make sure to have as much sustain through HP and armor class and initiative as possible for when you break out of your wild shaping so you can still perform your tank duties and adapt quickly to the situation in humanoid form, but also to start off combat as well as possible. And notion number 3, give us some kind of bonus to maintain our concentration spells as much as possible because those, technically speaking, transfer over to when you enter wild shape and thus we still benefit from them in our wild shape forms. With all of that then in mind, let's go over our gear. First of all, we start out with our shapeshifter hat. This hat was just made for us shapeshifters and is really good actually because it increases our wild shape charges by one per every long rest. And when you think what I said earlier about how these wild shape charges can technically be considered as shields, you can read this passive as basically saying, here, have another 100 HP for dire situations when needed every single long rest. And that is obviously huge value for when things go south and having such sustain for honor mode is amazing and this hat is also just nice for flexibility sake as you have an extra opportunity to wild shape every long rest then we get the vivacious cloak for our cloak gives us temporary hp when we cast a spell in melee range great cloak for sustain then we have another wild shape exclusive piece right here for our chest piece the armor of moon basking this thing is an absolute must have it has a bunch of effects that all apply in your wild shaping form we're talking a bunch of extra HP, reduced incoming HP, higher armor class, and advantage on saving throws. This thing right here is orgasm inducing. Alternatively, for a more offensive option, the mutilated carapace is a great piece too and works when wild shaping. For your gloves, my first choice is going to be the wondrous gloves. You get it really early on and it gives extra armor class. Do I need to say more? However, if you have a pesky bard in your team, which very well might, considering the synergy with extra short rest and more wild shape charges, and you want to desperately give it to them then the gauntlet of the tyrant or the hell dust gloves are great as well for maintaining our concentration spells but the first is going to be obtained quite late on in act 3 and the second might be contested yet again by say a sorcerer in your party so if all of those are not up for the grabbing then i would finally grab the stalker gloves for that extra initiative Regarding boots, we grab the Boots of Striding, which is an absolutely amazing piece for this build since we have so many concentration spells, so that momentum is very welcome. But the main selling point here is that immunity to prone while concentrating, and as you may or may not know, prone is a major offender for breaking concentration prematurely, as well as it's just being an annoying status effect to have on you because you have to basically waste your turn to get out of it. Also, very important to note, Focus Stride, which provides this effect, carries over into your wild shaping form, as you see here, meaning your wild shaped forms will in fact benefit from that immunity to getting knocked prone. Absolute best in slot boots for this build. 
Next up is going to be the Defender Flail for our main weapon. Now, we don't really want to use our weapon, right? So it's wasted to get something here that's really good offensively and has some amazing offensive ability. No, we want something that has sustained for our main weapon and has more the property of a armor piece than a weapon. And the Defender Flail does exactly that. It is amazing for that purpose. It gives armor class and reduces incoming damage with the Steel Physiology trait. Excellent option for this build. We also grab a shield and the Sentinel shield is absolutely amazing for this build. Fun thing is that it gives us advantage perception ability checks, which are really annoying if your party fails them. But obviously, the main selling point here is we want that armor class and also that huge plus three bonus to our initiative rolls. And this is actually just like getting alert on a gear piece, really. With this piece and our high initial dexterity investment, it pretty much means we will kick off many fights in our humanoid form, which gives us that early concentration spell or that early area modification to immediately ruin our enemy's life or that early wild shape comboing with a spell. So many great things you have with higher initiative. And this shield was just really made for this build, in my humble opinion. For our bow, we go then with the Gaunter male bow. Reason being is that it just gives you a free haste with no lethargic condition and haste is overpowered for builds like these that already attack so many times. And if we ever need to snipe things, well, both of Celestial Light will be there for us. Rings, we go Shapeshifter's Boon Ring. It is another ring that works in shapeshifting and gives us a plus 1d4 bonus to all the checks that we have while wild shaping. And the other ring is going to be the Ring of Regeneration for that extra stain. If the Ring of Protection is not contested by anyone in your party, you can alternatively use that instead of the Shapeshifter's Boon Ring, in my opinion, for even more armor class and saving throw bonuses. And finally, we get the Corvette token for our amulet. This is the only amulet in the game that actually synergizes with our wild shaping forms, giving us extra mobility by an enhancing our jump and it also gives us a permanent feather fall that also persists while we're wild shaping. Now the amulet of the harpers is a decent alternative amulet as well. It gives us shield for free and advantage on our wisdom saving throws which can be useful in some scenarios. If nobody is contesting the amulet of the vowed in your party then that is a great alternative amulet as well due to the spell save DCs. However be careful because it is a best in slot item for many cleric builds. One more thing I have to note is that things like Mirror of Laws and the potion that you get in Act 2 that permanently boosts your strength by 2 actually also works for your wild shaped forms. So that is a plus for bonus that you can use and synergize with Terran Brawler for even higher accuracy and damage. And these two elements are a very important thing to keep in mind to make sure your wild shaped forms become even stronger. And with that we have come to an end. We have discussed everything possible about the moon route and how to make it as optimal as possible. With this build you have absolutely everything. You are a massive tank with several hundreds of HP potential with so many different forms and kits that you can tackle on any scenario, any situation in combat and with your CC you can really ruin the lives of your enemies and make everything much better for yourself and your party and your damage output is absolutely amazing as well making you not just a powerful meat shield but also a powerful obliterating force that can attack many times per turn and does so in style as well if I may say so. It took a long ass time to discuss everything needed for this video, for this build, as there are like 8 million aspects to this class, but that also obviously makes it one of the most fun builds and really powerful now as well with that Tavern Brawler fix. So all in all, this is a S plus tier build in my humble opinion. And if you want a written guide of this build and just everything I just said, check my Patreon. I put those on there and you at the same time can support the channel and future videos if you obviously like the idea of that and becoming a patron. But otherwise, giving the video a like, subscribing is more than I can ask for. So if you haven't done that yet, consider doing that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you all for watching and enjoy being this massive monster on the battlefield going forward.